Section 10 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 6, Part 1. The Vilcanota Country and the Peruvian Highlanders. In the northernmost part of the Titicaca Basin are the grassy foothills of the Cordillera Vilcanota, where large herds of alpacas thrive on the sweet, tender pasturage. Santa Rosa is the principal town. Here wool buyers come to buy for the clip. The high prices which alpaca fleece commands have brought prosperity. Excellent blankets, renowned in southern Peru for their weight and texture, are made here on hand looms. Notwithstanding the altitude, nearly as great as the top of Pike's Peak, the stocky inhabitants of Santa Rosa are hardy, vigorous, and energetic. Ricardo Charaja, the best Quichua assistant we ever had, came from Santa Rosa. Nearly all the citizens are of pure Indian stock. They own many fine llamas. There is abundant pasturage, and the llamas are well cared for by the Indians, who become personally attached to their flocks and are loath to part with any of the individuals. Once I attempted through a Cusco acquaintance to secure the skin and skeleton of a fine llama for the Yale Museum. My friend was favorably known and spoke the Quichua language fluently. He offered a good price and obtained from various llama owners promises to bring the hide and bones of one of their camels for shipment. But they never did. Apparently they regarded it as unlucky to kill a llama, and none happened to die at the right time. The llamas never show affection for their masters, as horses often do. On the other hand, I have never seen a llama kick or bite at its owner. The llama was the only beast of burden known in either North or South America before Columbus. It was found by the Spaniards in all parts of Inca land. Its small two-toed feet, with their rough pads, enable it to walk easily on slopes too rough or steep for even a nimble-footed mountain-bred mule. It has the reputation of being an unpleasant pet, due to its ability to sneeze or spit for a considerable distance a small quantity of acrid saliva. When I was in college, Barnum's Circus came to town. The menagerie included a dozen llamas, whose supercilious expression, inoffensive looks, and small size, they are only three feet high at the shoulder, tempted some little urchins to tease them. When the llamas felt that the time had come for reprisals, their aim was straight and the result a precipitate retreat. Their tormentors, howling and rubbing their eyes, had to run home and wash their faces. Curiously enough, in the two years which I have spent in the Peruvian highlands, I have never seen a llama so attack a single human being. On the other hand, when I was in Santa Rosa in 1915, someone had a tame vicuña which was perfectly willing to sneeze straight at any stranger who came within twenty feet of it, even if one's motive was nothing more annoying than scientific curiosity. The vicuña is the smallest American camel, yet its long, slender neck, small head, long legs, and small body, from which hangs long, feathery fleece, make it look more like an ostrich than a camel. In the churchyard of Santa Rosa are two or three gnarled trees, which have been carefully preserved for centuries as objects of respect and veneration. Some travelers have thought that 14,000 feet is above the tree line, but the presence of these trees at Santa Rosa would seem to show that the use of the words tree line is a misnomer in the Andes. Mr. Cook believes that the Peruvian plateau, with the exception of the coastal deserts, was once well covered with forests. When man first came into the Andes, everything except rocky ledges, snow fields, and glaciers was covered with forest growth. Although many districts are now entirely treeless, Mr. Cook found that the conditions of light, heat, and moisture even at the highest elevations, are sufficient to support the growth of trees. Also, that there is ample fertility of soil. His theories are well substantiated by several isolated tracts of forests, which I found growing alongside of glaciers at very high elevations. One forest in particular, on the slopes of Mount Soirococha, has been accurately determined by Mr. Bumstead to be over 15,000 feet above sea level. It is cut off from the inhabited valley by rock falls and precipices, 
so it has not been available for fuel. Virgin forests are not known to exist in the Peruvian highlands on any lands which could have been cultivated. A certain amount of natural reforestation with native trees is taking place on abandoned agricultural terraces in some of the high valleys. Although these trees belong to many different species and families, Mr. Cook found that they all have this striking peculiarity. When cut down, they sprout readily from the stumps and are able to survive repeated pollarding, remarkable evidence of the fact that the primeval forests of Peru were long ago cut down for fuel or burned over for agriculture. Near the Santa Rosa trees is a tall bell tower. The sight of a picturesque belfry with four or five bells of different sizes, hanging each in its respective window, makes a strong appeal. It is quite otherwise on Sunday mornings, when these same bells, out of tune with themselves, or actually cracked, are all rung at the same time. The resulting clangor and din is unforgettable. I presume the Chinese would say it was intended to drive away the devils, and surely such noise must be thoroughly uncongenial even to the most irreclaimable devil, as Lord Frederick Hamilton said of the Canton practices. Church bells in the United States and England are usually sweet-toned and intended to invite the hearer to come to service, or else they ring out in joyous peals to announce some festive occasion. There is nothing inviting or joyous about the bells in southern Peru. Once in a while one may hear a bell of deep, sweet tone, like that of the great bell in Cusco, which is tolled when the last sacrament is being administered to a dying Christian. But the general idea of bell-ringers in this part of the world seems to be to make the greatest possible amount of racket and clamor. On popular saints' days, this is accompanied by firecrackers, aerial bombs, and other noise-making devices which again remind one of Chinese folkways. Perhaps it is merely that fundamental fondness for making a noise which is found in all healthy children. On Sunday afternoon, the Plaza of Santa Rosa was well filled with Quichua holiday-makers, many of whom had been imbibing freely of chicha, a mild native brew usually made from ripe corn. The crowd was remarkably good-natured and given to an unusual amount of laughter and gaiety. For them, Sunday is truly a day of rest, recreation, and sociability. On weekdays, most of them, even the smaller boys, are off on the mountain pastures, watching the herds whose wool brings prosperity to Santa Rosa. One sometimes finds the mountain Indians on Sunday afternoon sodden, thoroughly soaked with chicha, and inclined to resent the presence of inquisitive strangers. Not so these good folk of Santa Rosa. To be sure, the female vendors of eggs, potatoes, peppers, and sundry native vegetables, squatting in two long rows on the plaza, did not enjoy being photographed, but the men and boys crowded eagerly forward, very much interested in my endeavors. Some of the Indian alcaldes, local magistrates, elected yearly to serve as the responsible officials for villages or tribal precincts, were very helpful, and armed with their large, silver-mounted staffs of office, tried to bring the shy, retiring women of the marketplace to stand in a frightened, disgruntled, barefooted group before the camera. The women were dressed in the customary tight bodices, heavy woolen skirts, and voluminous petticoats of the plateau. Over their shoulders were pinned heavy woolen shawls, woven on hand looms. On their heads were reversible pancake hats made of straw, covered on the wet weather side with coarse woolen stuff, and on the fair weather side with tinsel and velveteen. In accordance with local custom, tassels and fringes hung down on both sides. It is said that the first Inca ordered the dresses of each village to be different, so that his officials might know to which tribe an Indian belonged. It was only with great difficulty, and by the combined efforts of a good-natured priest, the gobernador, or mayor, and the alcaldes, that a dozen very reluctant females were finally persuaded to face the camera. The expression of their faces was very eloquent. Some were highly indignant. Others looked foolish or supercilious. Two or three were thoroughly frightened, not knowing what evil might befall them next. Not one gave any evidence of enjoying it or taking the matter as a good joke, although that was the attitude assumed by all their male acquaintances. In fact, some of the men were so anxious to have their pictures taken that they followed us about and posed on the edge of every group. Men and boys all wore knitted woolen caps with ear flaps, which they seldom remove either day or night. 
On top of these were large felt hats, turned up in front so as to give a bold aspect to their husky wearers. Over their shoulders were heavy woolen ponchos, decorated with bright stripes. Their trousers end abruptly halfway between knee and ankle, a convenient style for herdsmen who have to walk in the long, dewy grasses of the plateau. These high-water pantaloons do not look badly when worn with sandals, as is the usual custom. But since this was Sunday, all the well-to-do men had put on European boots, which did not come up to the bottom of their trousers, and produced a singular effect, hardly likely to become fashionable. The prosperity of the town was also shown by corrugated iron roofs. Far less picturesque than thatch or tile, they require less attention and give greater satisfaction during the rainy season. They can also be securely bolted to the rafters. On this wind-swept plateau, we frequently noticed that a thatched roof was held in place by ropes passed over the house and weights resting on the roof. Sometimes to the peak of a gable are fastened crosses, tiny flags, or the skulls of animals, probably to avert the evil eye or bring good luck. Horseshoes do not seem to be in demand. Horses' skulls, however, are deemed very efficacious. On the rim of the Titicaca Basin is La Raya. The watershed is so level that it is almost impossible to say whether any particular raindrop will eventually find itself in Lake Titicaca or in the Atlantic Ocean. The water from a spring near the railroad station of Araranca flows definitely to the north. This spring may be said to be one of the sources of the Urubamba River, an important affluent of the Ucayali and also of the Amazon but I never have heard it referred to as the source of the Amazon except by an adventurous lecturer, Captain Blank, whose moving picture entertainment bore the alluring title From the Source to the Mouth of the Amazon. As most of his pictures of wild animals in the jungle looked as though they were taken in the zoological gardens at Para, and the exciting tragedies of his canoe trip were actually staged near a friendly hacienda at Santa Ana, less than a week's journey from Cusco, it is perhaps unnecessary to censure him for giving this particular little spring such a pretentious title. The Urubamba River is known by various names to the people who live on its banks. The upper portion is sometimes spoken of as the Wilcanota, a term which applies to a lake as well as to the snow-covered peaks of the Cordillera in this vicinity. The lower portion was called by the Incas the Wilca or the Wilcamayu. Near the water parting of La Raya, I noticed the remains of an interesting wall which may have served centuries ago to divide the Incas of Cusco from the Collas, or warlike tribes of the Titicaca Basin. In places the wall has been kept in repair by the owners of grazing lands, but most of it can be but dimly traced across the valley and up the neighboring slopes to the cliffs of the Cordillera Wilcanota. It was built of rough stones. Near the historic wall are the ruins of ancient houses, possibly once occupied by an Inca garrison. I observe no ashlers among the ruins, nor any evidence of careful masonry. It seems to me likely that it was a hastily thrown-up fortification, serving for a single military campaign, rather than any permanent affair like the Roman Wall of North Britain or the Great Wall of China. We know from tradition that war was frequently waged between the peoples of the Titicaca Basin and those of the Urubamba and Cusco Valleys. It is possible that this is a relic of one of those wars. On the other hand, it may be much older than the Incas. Montesinos, one of the best early historians, tells us of Titu Yupanqui, Pachacuti VI, 62nd of the Peruvian Amautas, rulers who long preceded the Incas. Against Pachacuti VI there came, about 800 A.D., large hordes of fierce soldiers from the south and east, laying waste fields and capturing cities and towns, evidently barbarian migrations which appear to have continued for some time. During these wars the ancient civilization, which had been built up with so much care and difficulty during the preceding twenty centuries, was seriously threatened. Pachacuti VI, more religious than warlike, ruler of a people whose great achievements had been agricultural rather than military, was frightened by his soothsayers and priests. They told him of many bad omens. Instead of inducing him to follow a policy of military preparedness, he was urged to make sacrifices to the deities. Nevertheless, he ordered his captains to fortify the strategic points 
and make preparations for defense. The invaders may have come from Argentina. It is possible that they were spurred on by hunger and famine, caused by the gradual exhaustion of forested areas and the subsequent spread of untillable grasslands on the Great Pampas. Montesinos indicates that many of the people who came up into the highlands at that time were seeking arable lands for their crops and were fleeing from a race of giants, possibly Patagonians or Araucanians, who had expelled them from their own lands. On their journey they had passed over plains, swamps, and jungles. It is obvious that a great readjustment of the Aborigines was in progress. The governors of the districts through which these hordes passed were not able to summon enough strength to resist them. Pachacuti the sixth assembled a larger part of his army near the pass of La Raya and awaited the approach of the enemy. If the accounts given in Montesinos are true, this wall near La Raya may have been built around 1100 years ago by the chiefs who were told to fortify the strategic points. Certainly the pass of La Raya, long the gateway from the Titicaca Basin to the important cities and towns of the Urubamba Basin, was the key to the situation. It is probable that Pachacuti VI drew up his army behind this wall. His men were undoubtedly armed with slings, the weapon most familiar to the highland shepherds. The invaders, however, carried bows and arrows, more effective arms, swifter, more difficult to see, less easy to dodge. As Pachacuti VI was carried over the field of battle on a golden stretcher, encouraging his men, he was killed by an arrow. His army was routed. Montesinos states that only five hundred escaped. Leaving behind their wounded, they fled to Tamputoco, a healthy place where there was a cave in which they hid the precious body of their ruler. Most writers believe this to be at Pacaritampu, where there are caves under an interesting carved rock. There is no place in Peru today which still bears the name of Tamputoco. To try and identify it with some of the ruins which do exist, and whose modern names are not found in the early Spanish writers, has been one of the principal objects of my expeditions to Peru, as will be described in subsequent chapters. End of section 10